I want to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, special program of the Robert C. Byrd Center for Congressional History and Education at Shepherd University uh, at she in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, on the banks of the lovely Potomac, just 70 miles from Washington, D.C. And um, I'm Ray Smock, the interim director of the Byrd Center, and I will be introducing our speaker this evening. And then uh, following the speaker's remarks, uh, my colleague Jody Brummage uh, will uh, entertain your uh, uh, questions in chat. And uh, he will moderate those questions. And so uh, that's the way we will uh, run the rest of the program after the speaker's uh, uh, comments. Our mission at the Bird Center uh, is to promote a better understanding of of representative democracy. And we do it through programs like this. Uh, we do it through our Teacher Institute for Civics Education and through research on the Constitution and the Congress. And um, tonight we are very pleased and honored uh, to present uh, David Pepper. Uh, and he is the author of uh, Laboratories for Autocracy, a wake up call from behind the scenes He's been an officer of, of the uh, office holder in Ohio and is former chairman of, of the Ohio Democratic Party. He's a graduate of Yale and Yale Law School. And he worked for in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia uh, for the DC based uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, he is a, a teach, uh, teaches uh, election law and voting rights at the University of Cincinnati College of Law. While most of the nation's uh, press focuses on the disarray in our national politics, too few focus on the heart of the problem in state legislatures. It is the states that run our election machinery. It is the states that draw election districts after every US census. Corruption in state houses threatens our democracy. Yet we know so little about this aspect of the problem. And this is why David's important book is indeed a wake up call. I might mention also uh, that David is a writer of political thrillers, uh, such as The People's House and The Voter File, where conspiracies in high places need to be uncovered. And sometimes, as you all well know, uh, that through fiction, you can get at truths that you can't get at any other way. Uh, in The People's House, for example, the reporter hero of the book uncovers Russian influence in house elections. And this was written before the 2016 election. His newest thriller due out in August is entitled A Simple Choice and begins with the mystery surrounding a prominent Senator from Maine who jumps off a cliff. Stay tuned. But tonight, David's focus is on the threat to American democracy that is coming from our state legislatures and what we can do about it. Welcome, David, and take it away. Thank you, Ray. I so appreciate being with you today. So wait, uh, am I not up yet, am I? Okay. Uh, let me uh, just thank you. I, I'm, a, I'm really honored to, to be with you all tonight. Um, and uh, by the interest in, in from, from a center like yours that I think is so well respected, uh, I, um, I met a number of folks from West Virginia on a call, I think, in January, and uh, I'm excited that we could continue the conversation here. Uh, I have driven through your state many times. Um, the first book I mentioned to Ray once, uh, the, I have an action scene in Breezewood, Pennsylvania, and it's in that town because I've driven many times from Ohio to D.C. through Breezewood and, 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 and West Virginia. I cross a little bit. I've also driven the... Uh, Kentucky, West Virginia route to DC. So I've been your state through it many times and have always enjoyed it. Um, so let me just start. I mean, it, let, me, let me just take a step back. I'm going to talk about some pretty bleak things. Uh, unfortunately, the state of our democracy right now is pretty bleak, but my hope is to have enough time, both by the end of what I have to say, as well as Q&A to say, I say all this stuff, uh, but I also say it in the end with optimism that if we can really grapple with the challenges as they are, we actually then can solve them. And I wrote the book in the same spirit. So yes, uh, a lot of what I'll talk about is uh, 
understandably alarming, uh, but I don't do it to, to reduce hope. I do it to actually have us all think about um, the, the, what we're facing starkly. So when we start energizing to, to fix problems, we actually do it correctly. And that's sort of the purpose of this. And I'll try and do a little bit of both focus on the problem as well as solutions. Then I'll look forward to your questions. So let me just start out with sort of a hypothetical uh, that, that allows the conversation to get going. So what if we, um, and by the way, my throat's a little, a little sore from cheering for the Bengals so loudly. So I may take a few sips of water uh, as I go. Um, but what if a country did all the following uh, in a quick period of time, you know, some country in Europe or Asia or somewhere else, they rigged all their legislative elections so that 99% of the results were guaranteed and a minority in that country retained power regardless of how the voters actually voted. What if they attacked the independent operations of elections, uh, including the vote counting process uh, and asserted more control over that? What if they literally specifically targeted the means by which the voters of the opposition party voted? What if they targeted the protesters that largely reflected that opposition party? Or what if they attacked independent courts? And I'm saying if they all do all these things, what if they ignored or violated the elected will of their own electorate that, that had uh, you know, uh, reflected itself through referenda or ignored their own state by uh, nations by uh, constitutions? Or they changed the laws to protect themselves from being held accountable for corruption or even started trying to censor history uh, from the elements that cast a bad light on the, on the past. You know, I know you're thinking when you hear this, um, well, yeah, we've seen this. Places like Russia, Viktor Orban, if you're paying attention to Hungary, is doing some of this type of work. Um, but I, I bring all this up, and I think some of you will know this. Everything I just described is the sequence of events happening in state houses around the country right now. Not all of them, but far too many of them for us to be comfortable. Every single thing that I just described is happening again and again in state houses. And I believe that right now we're blind to it. We, will, we see this sequence is very disturbing in another country, but most Americans confident in our democracy, um, you know, just feeling patriotic, just assume that can't happen here. So when it's happening here, we don't see it as clearly as we would with somewhere else. But in state houses around this country, all these things are happening as we speak. And that's why, you know, the, the, there really is a, a crisis in American democracy. And because it's happening in state houses, and this is a key point, it, it doesn't just threaten the governance in each state. And I'll go through this. State houses, as our founding fathers on would, would say, are also at the heart of the shaping of American democracy. So more than maybe in other countries, if states around this country are pursuing these sort of extreme undemocratic agendas, it doesn't just threaten governance in those states, which it does, but it also threatens the, the stability of the entire nation's democracy. And that I'm afraid to say is happening as we speak because of what I'm gonna describe. Uh, but let me just start by going back and Ray, Ray uh, tapped into this a little bit. So much of this is happening. Now, this is changing quickly. When I started the book, there wasn't as much attention as there is now. But so much of this is happening um, because I would say, uh, in, in, and I put this in the book, in many ways, in this, I say this respectfully, there are a lot of good people in state houses and working hard, but that doesn't change the fact that institutionally, state houses in many ways are the Achilles heel of American governance. Um, and that, that for a combination of, of reasons, They're, they do have a lot of power. And sometimes that power is not understood. My guess is a lot of folks on this call do understand it. But as you know, state houses have a massive impact on the, the economy in the state, whether it be taxes or wages or however, you know, all sorts of factors in the economy. Clearly a massive influence on the health care of a state. An enormous responsibility. In some cases, the biggest budget item is education in that state, both secondary and primary, as well as college. States have a huge influence over, over energy and climate issues. Social issues are all can be set by states. So huge amount of power in states to impact all of our lives. Um, but there's another power in states that also is poorly understood. And that is that states in our country have a uniquely powerful role over elections themselves, over democracy. In many ways, they, more than the federal government, although it's changed over the years, they are sort of the first movers 
when it comes to designing and running the democracy of elections within states at both the state and federal level elections. They, they draw up the election rules, when you vote, how you vote, and that also ends up impacting who votes, as we all know. They draw district lines for themselves and for Congress in most states. Uh, they determine, as Donald Trump figured out a little too late, but, but it's, it's true, they can play a massive role over the, um, the uh, presidential electoral process. So state legislatures are the ones who possess that power. Uh, and another thing that, that um, these states have that often is overlooked, but if you watch closely, and my book is uh, uh, focuses a lot on Ohio, but this is true elsewhere, they actually have a lot of power over other offices. Yes, federal government decides how to spend money in states, but these statewide officials, uh, these state house officials in setting these budgets have a big impact on how that money ultimately comes to the state or if it does at all. Uh, they can run over through different leverage points the more moderating influences of statewide officials like governors. I can't speak for West Virginia, but in Ohio, we've had a more moderate governor. Uh, he literally gets you know, neutered all the time by a state house that won't go along with what he wants on COVID, on the budget, you name it. Uh, they also, in a lot of states, and Ohio is one of them, they have the ability to supersede local laws sometimes. I think you know, they can push the envelope in some states and just negate local mayors or city councils from actually doing their jobs if they want to. So they have a lot of power. And here's the problem. So when I say they're an Achilles heel, it's not that they don't have power. It's that there's a mismatch between their power and the awareness of their power. Um, most people have no idea who these people are, what the state house really does, you know, bigger picture or day to day. A very weakened media means that very little comes out in terms of news coverage versus what you hear about DC or even local city halls in many states. You, in Cincinnati, I hear a lot more about city hall than state house. The, the media is really weakened in states, so there are very few reporters covering it, covering it. In many cases, they have very short sessions. The capitals are far away. You name it, there's just very little attention, but a lot of power. And that leads to this, a, a true weakness that's a very weak, small d democratic form of governance if most people don't know what these places are doing and they have a lot of power, makes it even worse. And here's the other thing I throw in there. There are some people who do know how much power these state houses have and they're right in those state capitals uh, and usually it's private players who, who feed off state government. They know exactly what state houses do. People back home don't know. That's a problem. And I go through in, in very stark terms how that problem influences financial policy, business policy, economic policy, social policy, also democracy itself. When you have a bunch of insiders who know what these folks do and are right in their face when the average people back home have no idea what they do. So that's, our, so that's a weakness. Now the weakness has been exploded in the last 10 years in the extreme gerrymandering that has inflicted our country. And we're seeing another round of it right now. And, and there's always been gerrymandering. I mean, Ray, any political scientists and others would tell you that. But what happened in 11 was especially extreme, um, where in a lot of states, you know, Ohio was blue. We had a majority congressional delegation in 08 and 10. We had a majority state house, Democratic governor, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. But with new mapping and technology and an intensity of purpose, they took states like Ohio. And it's, it's interesting because you can compare 2008 and 2012 in Ohio. Obama won Ohio by the same amount both times. It was the same blue map. That was true in Michigan and Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. In each of those states and men, gerrymandering man in Ohio, for example, a 10 Democrat, eight Republican congressional delegation was converted to a 12 Republican, four Democrat delegation. 10-8 one way to 12-4 the other. Michigan went 8-7 Democrat to 9-5 Republican. Pennsylvania 12-7 to 5-13. They absolutely flipped. And in states like Ohio, that 12-4 gerrymander never changed one time the entire decade, no matter what the voters did. Blue year, red year, same result. Same story on state houses. And in many ways, the state house gerrymandering is even more important. A majority Democratic state house in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, in 08, in all those states by 12, 
same blue map, Obama winning, each one of those states became a majority or supermajority Republican legislature guaranteed, rigged as rigged can be, never to change. In Ohio, 99% of the districts for the next decade performed exactly as they drew them to perform. So the lack of accountability and lack of awareness I talked about before got really worse over the course of the last decade, where basically every single election was decided in a, in a hotel room in 2011. Uh, there's one though, there, there's more to the gerrymandering story than I can even explain through those numbers. And this is gonna sound, let me take a sip of water real quick. This is gonna, the data, and by the way, this is gonna sound like a shameless book plug. Please buy the book. I'm gonna present this quickly. The book, I think Ray will agree, goes all through a lot more detail. And what I'm saying tonight will not replace reading the whole book, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just hit the high points for you. Um, we are that 2011 gerrymander basically put into power a generation of people because we have eight year term limits and this is true elsewhere too a generation of people who rose to power and have stayed in power devoid of democracy they literally have not been in real elections and just to just to put a number on that and i didn't even realize this until i started studying it they basically guaranteed themselves 62 seats when they gerrymandered the state in 2011. 62 out of 99, even though the state's about 50-50. Here's the makeup of the 62 seats they gave themselves. Oh, average, the average margin of victory for a decade in their 62 seats. 17 of those seats out of 62, the people in these offices averaged a 50% or better margin of victory. They are winning 75-25 or better every election for the decade and the next set of seats 21 more averaged a 30 point or better victory over a decade 65 35 next up 12 more seats averaged a 20 point margin of victory 60 40 or better that alone is 50 seats out of 99 that averaged a 20 percent margin of victory over a decade and then the next 12 averaged 10 or more um, either the whole decade or after a Democrat had been term limited. That's 62 seats where they're guaranteed victory, 55, 45, and most of them never even think about the next election. It's so rigged. So when I say it's a generation of people who've lived without a real election, the numbers show that that's exactly right. And one of the things that, that I, if you look closely in a place like Ohio, if you have if you have a generation of people who all they've ever known is a lack of democracy, what we're learning, especially the last couple of years with an explosion of anti-democratic legislation and attacks on some of the most basic norms we all cherish, and I'm sure you guys talk about every day at the center, you see that incentives get completely warped in the behavior of politicians. You know, we, we want a democracy in place it's the right thing for the voters, but we also assume that the checks and balances and, and, and um, accountability of elections makes people behave a certain way, ways that we want them to behave. You do a good job for the public, they reelect you. You're corrupt, you get booted from office. It turns out that in a system without democracy, which is basically across this country, what many of these state houses have become, the incentives are flipped. And I'll just give a couple examples of this. And again, I go through this in great detail in the book. If you're guaranteed your reelection, no matter how you do, you no longer have an incentive to perform good public outcomes. It just doesn't matter because you're going to get reelected. You're basically going to walk back into that office. But if you're if you are in that office where you're guaranteed election, who, who, who do you worry about more? Those private players who are in your face every single day in the Capitol where you are, who know exactly what you do. And you can see that play out in a state like Ohio. We have a perfect example how the incentive is more to keep the private players happy than deliver the public outcome. In the last 20 years, Ohio public schools have fallen from fifth to 26th in terms of their overall performance. At the same time, very relatedly, I'd actually call it causation, the state house has directed tons of public school money into the pockets of online for-profit charter school scams. But, but again, when I say scam, I'm not exaggerating. 
one is, has been bo broken down by the FBI and had to get shut down because they were claiming students that they, they couldn't prove took a class, but the money was being taken out of those public schools. The people who did this just kept getting reelected and they're, they're now statewide officials. Why? Because back home in the school districts, it didn't matter the schools were falling apart. They, the, there was no choice in the election anyway, and people didn't, couldn't even connect that it was a state house. They must have assumed it was the local school board, but the private players who got the big money from the scam gave a bunch of it to the politicians. So you have an incentive to keep them happy, and the fact that schools are collapsing around the state doesn't really matter as in terms of an incentive to get reelected. There are a lot more of incentives. There's there's not any incentive to push things that are popularly supported because you're in a district you can't lose. So, it, you know, ideas like a co basic common sense, let's say gun safety or trying to tackle climate change, health, broader access to health care, very popular ideas. In these state houses, that doesn't matter. It, it, it literally doesn't matter. In fact, it turns out that these state houses are the perfect place to go to get really unpopular things done because it's the one place you can do it without being booted from office. Um, there is very little incentive to combat corruption in a serious way because you're benefiting from it on the back end. Uh, and there's a huge incentive to be extreme because your biggest fear in life is a primary that will knock you out of office. So be as extreme as possible, avoid the primary, never work across party lines because that's how you lose a primary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the bottom line is there are these terribly uh, inverted incentives that really do make these places truly broken and behaving in the exact opposite of how we want public officials to behave. Now, if all that sounds bad enough, I'm making it a little bit worse and then a little bit worse than that before I go into what we could do about it. Um, I wish that I was the first person to discover this problem, um, but I'm not. And some of you already know about it. The problem is decades ago, certain institutions figured out everything I just described, that the incentives were screwed up, that these state houses could do a lot of power, had a lot of power to do a lot of things, that they were essentially undemocratic, so they were a good place to go get unpopular things done. And you will have heard of these groups, ALEC, the Koch brothers and others, basically figured out, my God, why, why bother with millions of lobbyists in Washington, D.C., when we can get almost our entire agenda done in state houses, without ever worrying about the people we, we help do it being held accountable. So they can do it again and again and again. And that's why what you've seen in the last, oh, for, for a generation, you've seen basically the weaponizing of state houses by national groups like ALEC to push a national agenda through state houses, whether it's privatizing education, attacking organized labor, social issues, uh, you know, what we're seeing in Texas around Roe v. Wade, undermining the Affordable Care Act, attacking certain rights of consumers, not wanting to do anything about climate change, trickle-down economics. State houses were where they went to get it all done because DC, it's hard to do and everyone's paying attention. Uh, but in, in, um, in uh, state houses, it's, it's like a home, you, get, you just get it all done. And the beauty of these state houses, as I've described is, the people can do any of this stuff and not lose which is why it's a great place to go to get this stuff done. Here, I, can, I always go through my book. I use the term laboratories very intentionally because the, one of the secrets is they're not just pushing towards autocracy. They are functioning as laboratories in that they are always learning from their mistakes, from their successes. And so what have they learned as they've done all the work I've talked about? The same lessons I mentioned before. They've learned that the popularity of issues don't matter. In fact, if it's an unpopular issue, go to a state house. They'll get it done, and they'll they'll all be there to tell the story and do it again later. Um, they do want to keep things secret because the biggest risk to what they're doing, and this happened a few times, if there's publicity around some really unpopular measure, the donors to these groups, the big companies, get cold feet. So they want to keep it secret, not because the politicians care because they're going to get reelected, but because major companies who are giving, and a lot of have quit after moments of controversy, walk away. So they do try and keep it a secret. Um, they learned what I said earlier, that legislators are actually, in the end, more able than you'd think to run over govern the, the statewide officials. They've also learned that because of the weak house, the weak state press, press corps, and the lack of attention on state houses, 
The best strategy is to overwhelm these state houses with activity, knowing that some of the things they push will get attention, maybe get controversial, have to be removed from the agenda. But if all the attention is on that controversial issue, a whole lot of other things will get through that no one ever wrote an article about or no one ever noticed. And I go through in the book in Ohio and other states, and you, I'm sure you see it, it happens all the time. In a budget, there are 10 hairy items. One gets all the attention and especially outrageous. Our last, last time around, ours was rural broadband. They were, trying to get, they were trying to cut it out of local government. That got all the attention. It ends up getting killed at the last second. Well, three other things happened. No one even wrote a story about. So there's, a, there's an advantage in these state houses with, with small press corps. Throw it all forward. Get it to happen. And by the way, once it happens in that state, every other state now has an example they use for their next budget to say, hey, they did in Ohio, do it somewhere else. So even though they only get 20 or 30% done, they then build on that in every other state as an example of a, quote, best practice that other states can do. So on a repeat game where many states are participating, that kind of frenzy that leads to some progress ends up building and building and building. And that's why right now, what are we seeing? An explosion of these things. And that's how they do, that's, that's really been a strategy that works. And here's maybe the most, and so they're always learning, and I won't go through all this right now, but they're always learning from every success or failure. That's the other advantage of throwing so much forward. If there was a reason that something failed, like in Ohio, they tried to crush collective bargaining in 2011. They included police and fire unions in that effort. It, it destroyed the effort, police and fire, campaign around the state, it lost. Well, in the future, other states trying to get rid of collective bargaining don't include police and fire. They learn the lesson. So by throwing a lot of stuff forward, they're also always learning from successes and failures to do it better the next time around. And again, because they're in these rigged state houses and they're not accountable, they can afford to make mistakes and keep going because they never lose. And the last thing that they learned, and this is really important when it comes to attacks on democracy, this is a very sobering thing. And, and, you know, some of these legislators would be very sad to hear me say this. It turns out the legislators, who they are, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the incentives I described in the lessons that I just talked about, all the legislators in these systems behave the exact same way. So if someone gets, you know, kicked out because of scandal, because they crossed the line or did something in their personal life that got them kicked out or someone else, you know, is term limited. What we find is the next person does the exact same thing. It really doesn't matter who the people are. And, and the Koch brothers basically understand that it doesn't matter. And what matters is that the incentives that lead to the same behavior everywhere stay in place. And so the key to this whole system that some are benefiting from, and by the way, I didn't mention this, but I need to say it. One of the things that's part and parcel with everything I just described, and someone, someone wrote this, is it's basically a massive, massive effort to privatize public resources and public assets. That's the theme, essentially, of these state houses. You know, whether it's schools or energy grids or you name it or trickle down, it's moving money from public resources of states into private hands. And that's why part and parcel with everything I just described is disastrous public outcomes. And so I'm not picking on either state. I do, I just cover in Ohio. We are seeing our healthcare numbers, our school numbers, our public education numbers, our student debt numbers plummet. We're seeing our population leave incredibly fast. The public outcomes that result from these broken systems are, are indefensible, but because they have gerrymandered districts, they don't pay the price. Um, but to keep all of that going, terrible outcomes, extremism, um, you know, semi or worse corruption, what they have learned is they also have to continue to make sure democracy is weak because this set of outcomes would never survive in a robust democracy. You could not get reelected on the records these people have amounted to. You know, they're too extreme, some are too corrupt, and their outcomes are too indefensible. So part and parcel, and this is why we see an acceleration on the democratic, on the tax on democracy in these places, is they could not win with these records in a robust democracy, and they know it. 
and their ideas are sufficiently unpopular that over time they would never succeed. Trickle down economics, where only a few do well, would never succeed in a robust democracy. You, they have to have a weakened democracy to get that done. And, and so we, what, we, what have we seen over the last decade since 2011? A nonstop attack on democracy and self to sustain everything I just described. You know, attacking the electorate, like the, the Obama coalition that turned these states blue in 08 through purging and voter suppression. Um, attacking workers and unions to undermine the funding of a lot of the, the pro-democracy or democratic side. We saw later in the decade an attack on independent off. We saw some Democrats win governor's offices um, in um, 06 and uh, sorry, in 16, 18. These legislators immediately start attacking those offices and undermining their powers. And then, of course, when we've won Supreme Court seats in Ohio and other places, another check on their power, they start attacking those, those independent courts, a, a true red line in a healthy democracy. And so What's happened in the last in 21, and this is you know a little bit different from the narrative that's talked about. What's happened in 21 is not some new response to the big lie. It's an extension of a decade of this stuff, it, you know, accelerating, but it's just a continuation of a decade. If you look close and you read the book, you'll see it. The the attacks on elections officials are exactly what they did after 18, where they started attacking governors. And attorneys general. The attacks on drop boxes are exactly what they did in 11, attacks on early voting. They basically, after a loss, they will go back and figure out exactly why they lost an election, and they'll change the rules and the laws to try and eliminate the reason they lost. In 21, that's drop boxes and other things. In 11, it was reducing early vote. That's why they thought Obama won. So, uh, and, and then, of course, we're seeing all sorts of other, you know, even more disturbing attacks on on, um, on democracy, again, censoring the big lie, stripping power from elections officials, doubling down on voting rights attacks. It's, it's an acceleration in a downward spiral of something that's been going on for, for a decade. So that's sort of uh, where we stand. And the way I'll, I'll, I'll sum up the overall where we stand, and I'll talk for two seconds about how we solve it, because I know Beverly, asked, Beverly just asked me that, and we can talk about a lot of that in Q&A. So essentially where we are right now in America is there is a battle over, there is a political battle taking place, but the two sides of that battle are fighting different battles. And this is the part that the one side needs to wake up. One side, and, my, and this is most of America, we've kind of assumed that democracy is intact and stable, that, that uh, democracy has always been there, will always be there, and so our goal, I'll put myself in this category, we have thought, well, since democracy is intact, our aim in life politically is to win elections to get substantive outcomes that we believe in. And we've all thought that, well, the best way to do that is the federal elections that determine so much of our lives. And if we win those, we win. If we lose them, we lose. But that's our battle. And that battle largely takes place in federal years. And it takes place in the, largely the swing states and swing districts that together add up to the majority you need to win the presidency or the Senate or the House, right? That's one side's battle. Here's the problem. Everything I just described about state houses clues you into the other side's battle. The other side understands that it actually will not succeed in a robust democracy. Its worldview and its policies are too extreme to do well in a robust democracy. So its battle isn't assuming democracy intact, fighting out elections. Its battle is to actually hold democracy back enough so that it can actually have its worldview in place despite the fact that it's a minority view. That's the other battle. Well, if that's their battle, they don't fight at the federal level because that's not where that battle is. State houses are how you win their battle. And you win their battle, not in swing states, but everywhere. You can seize some ground against democracy by taking any state house. And you win their battle by fighting out state house seats and all sorts of other seats like secretaries of state and elections offices at that state level. So here we have two sides. We have one side fighting the same old cyclical federal battle and judging everything based on whether or not they win the presidency in the center of the house. And woe is us if we lose them, we're the best if we win. The other side, fights that battle too, but every single year they're in that state battle. And because the, uh, the side that believes in democracy isn't really engaged in that state level, 
the side at the state level is always winning. They are always making ground. And the other side has not seen it for far too long. That's why I wrote my book, because I want people to see it. So the end of the book, and I'll talk about it quickly here, walks through how do we adjust to this? How do the people who believe in democracy, and by the way, this is bigger than just Democrats. This should be anybody who believes in democracy. How do we adjust to this multiple decade attack, knowing that we're late in the game? And the first thing I say is, we got to wake up to what the battle really is. It's a battle for democracy, and those who care about it need to readjust everything they do to focus on states. Of course, we'll win the federal elections. There are huge powers in the federal government that affect us, including, as they know, the appointment of judges and legislation like they should have passed to stop this stuff, which they have the power to pass in Congress. But the heart of the battle is state houses and, and the people believe in democracy better engage there. And if you engage there, it means your strategies are very different. You don't just fight in swing states anymore. You need to be fighting for democracy everywhere. And you need to fight where the battle is, which is state houses. You can no longer allow these people to be unaccountable doing these terrible things. You should not just be in state houses. You should be recruiting and supporting people in every single district and start making everyone in these systems feel accountable. Um, we need to have a long game mindset. Once you change your mindset around this battle, you should get out from the cycle to cycle mindset, which is how we've judged everything. It's a long game for democracy. It's a long fight, a long struggle, the way John Lewis understood it, the way you know su women suffragists understood it. The, in my best modern example, the way Stacey Abrams understood it. She knew the battle for Georgia was a long battle, so she didn't just judge everything on one cycle. And when she didn't quite win the governor's race in that very you know, sketchy election, she literally said the night that she said, I didn't win, that she made progress. Why? Because she had a long game mindset about what progress looked like there. She didn't win, but a lot more people voted, a lot more people registered, and she knew if she kept going, that was progress. Well, we all saw how right she was two years later when Georgia turned blue. Um, so we have to all have a long game mindset, a 50 state mindset, a democracy mindset, uh, if we're gonna succeed. I won't go through all the other details, but I'll simply close with this and then go to questions. Uh, there are senators and things they, they need to do or want them to do, and we should keep demanding it. Uh, there are billionaires who need to have spend money, not just in presidential cycles, but every all four years at every level. But the rest of us can't just wait for those people to get this together. We all have work to do. And in my book, without going through the specifics, uh, again, I hope you buy and read it. I go through how every one of us needs to challenge ourselves to think through what is our own personal footprint in this world of influence. And in our own personal footprint, whether it's this center or you're on the board of a homeless shelter or a food bank or you run a small business or you know the mayor of a town, are you using every part of your footprint to lift democracy? Because you need to. We all need to. We can't wait for Michelle Obama to come up with some organization to register voters, although she's doing that, or Stacey Abrams to come to our state and save us, although I hope she does. We all, the way we will scale up battling for democracy as fiercely as they're battling against it is if we all really think through and make a New Year's resolution, it's only February, we can still do it. What can you do right now to lift democracy? And I'll give an example. Are you on the board of a homeless shelter? Or are, they, are you registering homeless people? Are you registering people to the food bank? Have you asked the mayor that you know, if maybe you're a mayor yourself, are you lifting democracy in every single service you provide as a city? Are you passing out registration documents at the rec center, the library, the health clinic? Later on, are you giving out early vote uh, you know, opportunities to people? Um, all of us, in one other way, if there is a restaurant that's, put, that's passing out voter registration materials or other ways to inform the electorate, are you going there more than the place it doesn't? We need to put our money behind it all too. We, we shouldn't just boycott companies that air on Tucker Carlson ads. Let's support those who lift democracy. When Sherrod Brown was Secretary of State in Ohio, he had McDonald's in Ohio have a voter registration form on every one of those old menus that would be on the tray. If, if someone's doing that, you know, I'll go buy some French fries. Um, I'll buy it anyway, but I'll buy more. Um, the point is, Every one of us should be thinking through how do we use our footprint in this world to lift democracy. And, and, and in the end, more than any other thing we can do, but I'll talk about other things too, to questions, 
That is, I think, how we scale up pro-democracy that we can fight back. So with that, I will stop talking. I covered a lot of ground there. Would love to take your questions. Thank you so much, uh, David, and, and and thank you, everyone. I'm starting to see some of the questions pop into the chat box, and please continue to enter your questions uh, into that chat so that I can share them with our speaker tonight. There's a really interesting question that came across uh, early on that I think might be a good way to kind of kick off this part of, of our conversation, and that was um, something to the effect of... The, you mentioned how this is a long strategy. This is something that's been playing out over a, a period of time. And the questioner said, um, were they, did they success, did they come about this by identifying sort of a, a flaw or a weakness in the structure that was designed for our representative democracy in the in the constitution and the founding period of the country? Was there some sort of flaw that was there ready to be exploited? Or was it something completely new? So it's funny you ask that. So a couple of things, and someone might have mentioned this. So if you read the book, I, I, I dip my toe into a little con law and history at a couple of occasions. You know, the founders saw this flaw. Uh, James Madison wrote extensively about his worry about everything that's happening right now. He essentially predicted it was a risk. He said that, and they had had, when, when the um, Constitution was written, it was written in part because they'd had such a bad experience with state legislatures over the prior you know, generation. And they worried then that there was a flaw that I've described, that, that, that they could be more prone to corruption. They could be thinking more small ball than that what they hoped out of Congress. And they, he worried, literally Madison wrote in the Federalist paper several times, his worry was that the monarchy would literally go to state houses, undermine democracy in state houses to then undermine the nation's democracy with all those powers I talked about. At another point, he wrote about rich men, you know, at Koch brothers maybe, using state houses to get what they wanted and then undermining those state houses democracy to get what they wanted nationally. So the flaw was something that was thought of all the way back then. And one thing I'm very um, passionate about is uh, the guarantee clause in the Constitution. There's a clause that is totally overlooked. And it's the reason why, with all due respect, the filib to, to, to senators who voted this way, it's the reason why the filibuster is not a legitimate obstacle to legislation to protect democracy. Every senator takes an oath to the Constitution. And when they do that, they take an oath to abide by a clause that says the United States shall guarantee to all states a Republican form of government. That clause appears directly before the clause. This is how important that clause was to the founders. It appears directly before the clause that said the United States shall protect states from foreign invasion. But before the foreign invasion protection was a guarantee to provide um, a Republican form of government in all states. And we know the founders, they obsessed with about Republican form of government. And what they meant was that the that the will of the people was sovereign and not the monarchy, that these state houses should reflect the will of the people. And so they put that into the constitution, telling the United States and every senator and every congressman, if there is an attack on democracy in these states, in the way we've described, you know, rich men or the monarchy, you have an oath and a guarantee to stop that attack, just like you would a foreign power. And it's as powerful, there are, no, there are very few phrases in the Constitution, as powerful as shall guarantee. But that's what they did when they were talking about basically democratic governance in states. And so there was a worry, and there was a tool given to every member of Congress and the president to do something about these attacks, let alone additional tools given the 14th, 15th Amendment and other amendments. So yes, that was a flaw that was detected. The more short-term answer is, when you look back at the history of ALEC, in the history of the Koch brothers deciding to take some of their money from presidential and federal and put it in states, I'm not sure when they started, they knew it would be as effective as it was. In fact, it started off, uh, it started off being somewhat of a push for social issues, you know, uh, uh, tr driven a lot of it by, by uh, opposition to Roe v. Wade. It didn't really go very far. And it kind of died, but then they figured out, well, you can... Um, they figured out that they could um, get some of the economic agenda of some of the contributors achieved. And that's when it kind of grew a little bit. But it was after 2011 when Republicans took over governorships and state houses, 
that I think they re- with the extreme gerrymandering that they saw, my gosh, we can get everything we want done in 11 because, you know, Democrats weren't in governorships in all these states. 11 was when they really could put it to work. And that's when I think is the question asked. That's when I think they were like, my God, this this is incredible. And that's, I guess, is when they really saw how bad the incentives were. And if you look closely at the way they organize everything they do, they take direct in, ex, uh, uh, advantage of all the incentives I've talked about. They fly these, these legislators from small towns to fancy cities all over the country. They give them, quote, scholarships to pay for families to come and play for golf and nice dinners. Then they write legislation for them and they send them back to the hometowns and the and the state capitals to pass. They do all the work for them. And what's happened is, and again, they're always learning, the model that one group started, other groups are now saying, my God, that's so successful, we'll do it ourselves. So now you have, you know, Alec, you have the Heritage Foundation doing it for voting and gerrymandering. So I think they, the weakness was always there. They took advantage of it with a toe in the water, you know, 40 years ago. But then in 11 is when they really saw, my gosh, this is amazing. If we have anything we want to get done in this country, and especially if it's deeply unpopular, go to the state houses. They will do it, and they'll never lose office when they do. Next question. Can I take one that I'm looking at, by the way? Please do, yeah. I want to talk about Jim and Susan's question, uh, sort of, and then another. Because I think people ask about this privatizing. This is, to me, one of the real... uh, problems for what they're doing long term if we are smart enough to take advantage of it because of what's happening the corruption of these places as i said is pushing money from things the public values public education infrastructure um you know a a functioning energy grid into private hands that profit off it and part and parcel almost every time to that mass movement of resources to these private players is, as I said earlier, a disastrous collapse in public outcomes. And so one of the most important things I hope comes out of my book is to run for office in these states, don't talk about almost anything I've talked about tonight, although it's all accurate, talk about the failed public outcomes that people will feel in their lives. If it don't, you don't have to say every reason these outcomes happen. Maybe you don't even bring up the for profit charter school. I don't know. But Laura Kelly is a Democratic governor of Kansas right now. Why? Because she ran a whole campaign on the fact that they were down to four days of school a week. And that was outrageous for a state, as she wrote, that valued education. Beto O'Rourke is running hard on the idea that they couldn't even keep an energy grid going. So people froze to death a year ago. And it looks like that energy grid is still collapsing today. Why? Because they privatized it. Uh, in in, in uh, Michigan, it was Gretchen Whitmer saying, fix the damn roads. The point is, the, the long-term result of the privatization of so much of what people value is a corrosion in public outcomes that I think actually offers uh, a way out. Now, they have to, they're gerrymandering very hard to keep that from happening, but I actually think a discipline on message that you take to every part of every state these public outcomes aren't just falling apart in democratic areas. And I think in West Virginia, you're, you'd be experiencing this. Small towns in Ohio are dying because of it. In the same way, my guess is they're struggling there. It's the same reason. The lack of democracy is crushing these small towns. It's crushing their schools. It's crushing their businesses. Trickle down isn't working for them. And if we focus on those public outcomes, I think that's where that, their, their little game of privatization at some point runs out of steam. Next question, Jody. I think it's a really interesting point that you raise because, you know, when you mentioned how that impact can be seen in Appalachia, I mean, we don't have to look that far back in history to see how that transpires because in West Virginia, a century ago, the state was very much facing a similar problem, crumbling infrastructure because it was all built by coal companies that were losing their, their market share at that time. Um, and unable to maintain that infrastructure. So, right. um, you know, the archives at the Bird Center contain a lot of records that detail the effort to 
bring some type of public investment into those infrastructure um, uh, deficiencies in order to to uh, make up for that loss. So it's, it's, yeah. it is something that's not that distant in our past that we can look to a corollary. But it's interesting, it's come up a few times, and I think there's there's a question in the chat about this too. If gerrymandering is the, the key sort of tool of sustaining this process, yeah. how do we address that? What What is the solution for- So just, I, one you know, of the long game- one of the long game, um, before I get to that, let me just say, I agree on voter registration should be nonpartisan. Every restaurant, every, you know, do it everywhere. Don't just get them registered. That's good for democracy. Sarah's question. I, I think I, hopefully I walk through that when I, when I walk through the policy part, but I agree. You just, you don't just register people, you engage them throughout and you message on the public outcomes that I think are falling apart. I think that's your strongest broad based message in states like West Virginia, Ohio. Uh, to your question on gerrymandering, like there are, there are different solutions. And let me just be very direct. They need to pass the Freedom Vote Act and not have the filibuster block it. And they need to, we need to keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing. They, they are risking a, a generations without democracy. They don't pass that. And in the Freedom to Vote Act is a protection against gerrymandering. It lays out clear rules about what you can and cannot do. So you, could, you can't do it in Ohio and you can't do it in New York. And I will tell you, uh, I am a Democrat. I was chair of the party. I don't care who gerrymanders, it's bad. It leads to the, everything I talked about. Bad governance, bad outcomes, unaccountable politicians. If you don't pass a federal law, though, you're going to have a downward spiral. You're going to have a race to the bottom because if, if New York State and Illinois see what Ohio is doing, so the first solution is, and if any of you know a senator in West Virginia, the first solution is we have to pass this. I don't know if they pull it out or not, but they, they, they need to pass these standards. Now, the, the background, the backdrop to this is that, that the Supreme Court of the United States has said we cannot rule against a gerrymander is illegal because there aren't clear standards. Well, the federal, the Congress can add clear standards and should. And however they need to, whether it's this Senate session, and I hope it is still, I'm, I'm a stubborn optimist, or next, that's the best solution. Second best solution is states like ours can go to the ballot and change the rules of how it's done. Some states like Michigan, I talked to a group from Michigan last night, have gone to the, I would call it the best overall process, which is an independent commission. Get the politicians out of the room. They should not be drawing their own districts. It turns out, and I put this in the book, when put, up to, when put up to votes, the voters want that in many states. And in Michigan, other states, it passed. So some states have solved it through that. It didn't happen in our state. Republicans have enough power that if they're against something, they can basically destroy it through TV ads. So what, what did we do? Our backup plan was we lost the independent commission effort to change our constitution. But we passed what I described earlier. In 15 and 18, we passed two changes to our constitution that added real standards around what you're allowed to do when it comes to districting, what's allowed and what isn't allowed. Those passed 75%, 25%. And two weeks ago, our court of Ohio struck down the Republican effort to basically ignore those new rules. So independent commission best, second best is, is clear standards in your constitution, if you can do that. Um, obviously the federal government acting. And then if you're in a state without it, it's a lot harder. No matter what the best way to combat gerrymandering is don't let it keep you from running everywhere. The best, the best gift to a gerrymandered legislature, and this gets to long game thinking and rethinking everything we do. The best gift is if all we do is run in seats that we know we can win. And that allows them to be unaccountable in you know, 40% of the seats. Uh, we need to help candidates run in all these districts. So even though they may be gerrymandered, at least there's a conversation in every part of a state about what they're doing. And long term, we so if you haven't even changed the rules, and there are different ways to try and get there, and if you can get on the ballot and you do it right, these things pass. They do pass. Missouri passed one. Now they tried to. They ended up stopping it. But they, the Missouri is more conservative state than Ohio. They passed one. But even if you have a gerrymander map. Do not let them win by having you never run. Uh, I go through a lot more in the book about that. But one way I think about how to succeed in the long game, 
think about every aspect of what they're doing, or let's put it this way, think about every aspect of what they benefit from. What is their perfect state? Their perfect state is a weak media, people not running in half the offices, um, people at the, you know, focusing on the federal level, um, people not directly calling out what they're doing, but being awful polite about it. That is sort of the combination of things that make their life easy. Interrupt everything I just described. Whatever I just described that makes, and think about it this way in your own mind, whatever I just described that makes this easy to sustain, do the opposite. Run in every district, support everyone in every district, treat every candidate who steps up to run as a hero for democracy. Don't just celebrate the ones who have the best chance of winning. Celebrate all of them. It is harder to run a gerrymander district than in a swing district. Uh, that's braver. So treat those folks accordingly. So I would say all of these things, like think about what is their ideal state. And it's real easy when you start thinking how many things we are doing right now that make their life too easy in running these non-democratic you know, failing state houses. Interrupt every one of those things. And that could mean a lot of different things than you're doing now, but that's what we need to do. So I think that that maybe puts us in the place to to address a question that popped up in the chat, which is, you know, we lest we think that these things, if they're playing out in the states, that their greatest impact is taking place in the states. How can this affect our federal um, government, the function of the federal government, and and the um, the commenter mentioned specifically issues with. Um, documents that are submitted from the states regarding the electoral uh, college oh, yeah. and, the, and that process. Um, but are there other ways in which this can eventually um, uh, you know, impact the function of the, of the federal uh, government? I mean, in the end, that's, that's again why I wrote. So just to be clear, I didn't plan on writing a book this year. I've written novels, as Ray mentioned. I am excited about one coming out. I wrote this partly because of this question. It's alarming what they can do. And I go through the I go through the worst prospects in the book right before I pivot to you to the inspirational things you can all do to stop it. Um, but you know they can with enough state houses they can call a constitutional convention and change the constitution of our country without ever going to the voters. There is a there is a path to changing the constitution if enough state houses call a convention, and there are groups that are organizing to do that. In Ohio right now is a resolution in the Ohio legislature to join a constitutional convention that dozens of states have already voted to join. They can really, you know, mess around with the electoral college system. You know, there is a lot of new legal theory. So just so you know, when, when, uh, when Bush v. Gore was decided, there were a lot of opinions that were written. Obviously one side got the majority. Clarence Thomas wrote a, a, a concurring opinion that no one joined it basically said, well, when it comes to the electors, state legislatures have the power in the constitution to do whatever they want. They can decide on their own, they can overrule courts. It was, I can't remember the exact name of the, the theory, but it was this, it was a theory that basically it's all up to the state houses. And, and under that theory, if, if at, a week after an election, and this is kind of what Trump and others were building towards uh, before January 6th, if a legislature were to assert, well, we don't think that vote was legal. We think it was fraudulent and it's controversial and here's the evidence. So we as a legislature are gonna declare that this was the result and give these electors to the process on January 6th. Clarence Thomas's view is that that's what they get to do. And when he wrote that opinion in 2000, it was viewed as just insane, honestly, like way out in the way off the, well, I don't use that term, but just way out of left field, not legitimate. My worry now is we have a court that actually a lot of justices will agree with that. So they can really screw around, pardon my French, with the, with the electoral college. There are people running for office for state legislature all over the country right now who are asserting what I just described. And if they win, they'll push that. They can, they can call a convention. They clearly can rig districts again, and they're doing it. Um, Democrats, because of some of the reforms I mentioned, have stopped in some places like Ohio. I'm proud of that. And we all know that they can, in the end, and so in the book, I go through in great detail 
how their voter suppression efforts truly changed the electorate of Ohio. They saw the Obama coalition in 08, basically not just win, the, win Ohio for Obama, but win the state house for Democrats, win, the, you know, win other races. And for 10 years through purging and voter suppression tactics, they basically took apart the Obama coalition. So the voter suppression itself is a way to assert control and keep a minority they're scared of, I'm sorry, keep a majority that's emerging from actually knocking them out of power. So all those things are things they can do. And it affects the presidential election, Hillary Clinton's campaign, and, and there are all sorts of conversations we have about the good and the bad. It was kneecapped from the start because of the purging of voters in Ohio. She had to register hundreds of thousands of voters that were not, that had been knocked off the rolls in Ohio. And by the time she was done doing that, she couldn't pivot with her swing, with her, her swing vote message. So they can kneecap so much of campaigns through voter suppression too. So all of those things affect, like you said, who's in Congress, who's in the Senate, and who in the end is the president. And, and that is very, very worrisome, obviously. And they're showing an increasing willingness to do all of that without hesitation. Well, I think that perhaps um, the best question that I could, could uh, posit to sort of conclude uh, this conversation. And at the Bird Center, we do a lot of work with um, educators who are in classrooms um, uh, and, and tr providing materials training uh, in civics education. What would you um, say to them is the most important skill, the most important uh, message um, that they can pass along to their students who are the future inheritors and operators of this um, representative democracy? That's a great, I have not had that question asked one time. I, that's a great question. Let me do two things before I answer it. One, I'm going to put my email down. If, like Ray, you have a group of people anywhere and you say, I have a book club, I have access to this group, I want to do, and you want to meet and talk about the book, please let me know. You can email me there. I'd love to do it. Secondly, I am going to shamelessly put the link to my book up here because I don't want to just talk and not have you read. The book is much more important than anything I just said. Uh, and it goes through a lot more detail that I think will shock people into action and lays out the actions couple things, and I don't mean to talk for too long, but my guess is that this goes right into dovetails and like you said, your mission. There is nothing more disturbing than these attacks on history. And I, I was a history major. I don't claim to be a historian as, as a profession. But the parallel, the, there are patterns in our history that, are, that repeat like clockwork. And the parallels right now to, to what's happening, to, to what's happened in the past, are really worrisome. And so my first thing to educators, and I, you know, I was a well-educated kid. I went, I was fortunate and privileged to go to great schools. I still don't feel I was anywhere nearly educated enough on some of the real painful parts of our history. So trying to censor that history is, we're not, we're not doing it well enough. And when I talk about the parallels, and you, many of you will know this, but you know, after reconstruction in the South and the civil war, there was a, growing democracy in the South where black voters outnumbered white voters in Louisiana and, and other states and were voting literally uh, black uh, legislators into office, speakers of houses, mayors, Congress people. And, the, and again, our, our pattern as a country is when that diverse majority raises and starts to assert power, there's a backlash and it's fierce. And that backlash in the 80s and 90s of, eight, of the 1880s and 90s was violence and suppression and allegations that these new black voters were voting fraudulently and, and efforts to stop them from registering. And it led to Jim Crow for 70 years. And so I think one is without partisanship, and I'm a little partisan, so for those of you who aren't, I don't mean to come on too strong, but this isn't partisan. This is our history. And we have to teach it because the lessons are so clear. Two things. One, that it is a pattern, and two, there are ways to stop it. it. But if you fail to stop it, it will set in. There was an effort, and it reminded me of the vote a couple of weeks ago. In 1890, the federal government knew exactly what was happening. And they saw the suppression, and they saw the attacks. Ulysses Grant had gone to the South and 
brought in uh, federal troops to battle the KKK. They were fighting and fighting and fighting, but they finally let off the gas. In 1890, there was an act in, in, in Congress that was gonna really take it up a notch to stop everything. It passed the House and it failed in the Senate. And it was like a green light to keep going and everything kept going. So we have to teach this instructive about where we can go if we're not careful and how long a struggle it is. If you lose your democracy, it, I put it this way, a, a young black man in the 1880s in the South would have, let's say 25 years old, would have seen all around him mayors and legislators and even Congress people or lieutenant governors that look like him. Now, life was very difficult. I don't want to claim it was easy, but he would have probably thought, well, this is, you know, there are people who look like me. And 15 years later, all those people would be out of office because they, no one was voting anymore. Blacks were off the rolls. For the rest of that young man's life, his whole life, maybe his kid's life, never again would they see that. So the damage can go on for generations if you're not careful. And that's why first part of your very good question is history. The second part is I would beg and plead. I, I was, I'm honored to have gotten to know John Glenn very well. He was one of my first people I talked to when I ran for City Hall. And he was such a believer in public service. Like this, that's why he did it. I mean, his whole life is public service. He started the Glenn College for public service uh, at Ohio State. It would be if teachers are teaching young people, don't let the darkness and the cynicism of today's politics make them think that, that make them think that that's what it has to be. My very deep worry about young people and they're, if they're 30, all they've seen is horrible politics. They, you know, they saw what well, they would have been what? 15 when Obama was elected, meaning they saw people calling their doing birtherism on their president when they were 15. And my worry, they've never probably seen any state house elections that were not predetermined. And my, my hope to people teaching is, however you do it, and I teach election law and I try to do this in my class, don't let this next generation just think this is how it has to be, that, it, that it's this bad, that it's this cynical, that, that public service is some kind of awful profession that only the worst people go into. And right now, a lot of the, that is happening. But there was a day, and it's still here now, but there's a reason John Glenn went to be a senator, because it was the most noble of professions. And the best and the brightest and the smartest and the most public-minded wanted to do it for all the right reasons. And I would say that somehow, and they're educating young people to grab back, to, like not too far back, and I don't want to glorify everything from the past, but to grab this you know, sense that we've always, that I grew up with at least, that public service was noble and you should run for office at any level. And by the way, now it's more important than ever that you run for office because democracy itself is on the line. So I know that's a long answer, but, but it's a great question. And there's a lot to say about it. So keep teaching history and motivate people to stick with public service, even when it doesn't look too good right now. Well, I, I can certainly say that we appreciate that answer because that's a lot of what the Bird Center does. <laughs> and, and, I, I assume and when our... I said it, that you're like the Glenn Institute. <laughs> And our, 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 our namesake, I think, would probably very much agree. Um, and uh, with that, I, I just want to say, again, thank you so much for taking your time to be with us uh, this evening, to field the questions and engage in the conversation and share your research uh, and experience. Um, and uh, as you uh, plugged, I'll also put in a little plug um, that if you would like to get a copy of David's book or the book of really any speakers that you see featured at the Bird Center, you can um, obtain them from or through uh, our local bookshop, Four Seasons right. Books in Shepherdstown. Um, they are very uh, generous supporters um, and uh, sponsors of, of programs uh, like this. Um, and another incredibly important sponsor uh, to making programs like this possible are the Friends of the Bird Center. Many of you tonight in the um, Zoom audience are friends, but if you're not, I would encourage you to visit birdcenter.org support us 
where you can learn about how to become a part of the Bird Center's work of advancing representative democracy uh, by becoming a friend. Um, and a part of that is supporting programs like this. Um, with that, I would like to invite all of you to join us um, at the end of this month for our next program. We're actually doing a series of two events in one evening, um, partnering with the Nature Conservancy. And those two programs will revolve broadly around the topic of climate resiliency and conserving West Virginia forest land. Um, so it'll be an environmental policy um, uh, focused uh, program that we are doing in partnership with uh, Shepherd's Department of Environmental Studies and Appalachian uh, Studies and Communities. So thank you all again for being with us tonight. Thank you, David, again for your time. Um, and everyone have a wonderful evening and thank you again for your support of the Bird Center. Thank you, everybody. Really enjoyed it.